Okay, and now we have the slightly embarrassing situation that I am actually session chair for a paper which is partly authored by myself. Um, I, of course, disclaim all blame for this. Uh, however, the work was actually done by Paolo, whose talk we are going to see now, if I can get this thing to work again. Hi, everyone. My name is Paul, and I'm going to present the paper Algebraically Closed Fields in Isabel Hall. This is joint work with Florence Poulsen. So what is an algebraically closed field? Let's start with the field of real numbers and take a polynomial x squared minus one. It's a polynomial with both of its coefficients in the real line and moreover it has two roots, one and minus one, both real roots. But this property of having roots in the real line is not true for all the polynomials. For example, the polynomial x squared plus one has no root in the field of real numbers. So if we want a root for this polynomial, we would have to extend R with this imaginary unit I and impose the, it to satisfy the property of being a root of x squared plus one. So as we know, this gives rise to the field of complex numbers. We have the imaginary axis and the complex plane, a, a complex a complex number is a point in the plane which can be written as the sum of a real number and a multiple of the imaginary unit i. So what is interesting about the field of complex numbers is that not only our first polynomial x squared plus 1 has a root, but actually every polynomial with complex coefficients has a root. So if we take an arbitrary polynomial of degree n, we can find all of its n roots in the plane, every complex polynomial of degree n has, a, has n complex roots. So to sum up, C is a field. It includes the real numbers and it, it has the, satisfies the property that every polynomial has a root. Another way to state all of these properties would be to say that C is an algebraic closure of the real numbers. The property of having an algebraic closure is not exclusive to the real numbers. The mathematician Stein has shown that every field has an algebraic closure. And that was the formalization of our paper, the main formalization result. We shown that every field has an algebraic closure in Isabel. Now you may ask what's the relevance of a formalization result? Because in the past years, uh, we have seen a lot of profound mathematical statements being formalized. And here at least just a few. Uh, the theorem, the four-color theorem formalized by Contier, the odd order theorem by the Mathematical Components Project, the Kepler conjecture by the Flyspeck Project, and Godel's incompleteness theorems by Poulsen. And as I said, there are many more. So the 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 relevance of uh, any formalization comes from the issues that we found when we translate mathematics to a formal system. So in our case, when we translate the proof of the existence of algebraic closures to Isabel, a proof that is written in Zermilo's Frankel set theory and Isabel HOL, which is based upon simple type theory. So one of the principles of simple type theory is the distinction, the clear distinction between terms and types. In one side we have terms, and here I list a few, for example, constants, sets, pairs of terms, functions, propositions, numbers, of the application of function to a term. And the other, the other side we have the types, and for, for example, function types, product types, polymorphic types, and so on. And what can we do in simple type theory that relates to mathematics? For example, we can define a function that takes two numbers, a and b, and computes its sum. That is totally fine to do in, in simple type theory. Another example would be to take two real numbers, x and y, and compute the pair in the plane, the, the point in the plane composed where the first component is x and the second component is y. Now, an example of something we cannot do in simple type theory would be to define a tuple of size n where each of the components is equal to x. Why? Because think of the type we would have to assign to this term. 
it would be the type real star real n times and this is an example of a dependent type because the type depends on a term n so it breaks the, the principal distinction between terms and types that I mentioned before. Now, this limitation of simple type theory appears in the proof of the formalization of the proof of existence of algebraic closures. It's not the only issue, but it's the main one we will focus in this talk. Let's first recall the example in the beginning of the talk where we extended the real numbers with the imaginary units to build an algebraic closure of R. And let's see how are these things formalized in Isabel. So here uh, there are some equivalent definitions for the, the extension of R with the imaginary unit. And one side we have the usual definition, which is seen as a point in the plane, so a sum of a real number and a multiple of the imaginary unit. And in the other, in the other side, we have the, the, the representation that we, used in, that we used in the formalization, which is as the application of the imaginary unit to real polynomials. Why we use this representation? Because using the property that i is a square root of minus one, we can actually pro prove that these two are equivalent. Now, what is the type of these structures? So, for example, the real numbers, it, they have type real field, meaning that it's a structure whose carrier have elements of type real. Now, using the representation of complex numbers as the application of the imaginary unit to a real polynomial, we, we can we can, we can identify the, each real polynomial to a complex number. So we can use real polynomials as the elements in the carrier of this field. So when we extend the real numbers with the imaginary unit, we pass from a real field to a real poly field. And again, real poly is the type of real polynomials. Why am I recalling this example? Because we are going to be inspired by this idea of exchanging a field with a root of some polynomial to find the algebraic closure of any field. And we are going to see that the types of these structures follow the same transition from real field to real poly field. Now let's see the proof sketch that every field has an algebraic closure. We start with an arbitrary field K and our goal is to find its algebraic closure. Now, we will check if this field K is already algebraic closed. If it is, we are done, we, but if it's not, we can extend it with a root of some polynomial. And again, we see this transition of types from A field to A poly field. We check again if this field is, this new field is algebraic closure, closed or not. If it is, again, we are, we are done, but if it's not, we would have to extend it if yet another root. Now, since we are in the general case, we don't know how many times we are going to add roots. So we can suppose that we are going to add an arbitrary number of roots. And we see that from this transition in the types of these structures, we end up with the supposed algebraic closure of the field K having a type that it's dependent on the number of roots and therefore a limitation in, uh, in simple type theory to formalize this exact proof. Now I'm going to show you the proof that we formalized in Isabel and therefore show you the solution that we found for this limitation. And the idea is to come up with a type B and two functions f and g, f of type A to B and g of type b poly to b. Now the type b that we come up with in the development, in the development is the type of multivariated polynomials where the variables are indexed by polynomials with a coefficients. But I will not get into detail about the, this structure, 
but in, so we can just suppose that we have this type B and these functions f and g. And we are here, we are only interested in the structure of the proof, in the high level ideas. And the first step is to apply the function f to each of the elements of the field A, of the field K. We end up with a field whose elements have type B. And is this field whose elements have type B that we are going to extend with a root, the root epsilon zero. Now we see again the transition of types from B to B field. And what we do next is to apply the function G. That's why we have this function G of type B poly to B. We apply the function G to each of the elements of these new fields to, to return to something of type B field. So you can see that each time we add a root, we can return to the, to the type B field and we never get uh, ugly, uglier, uh, uglier types at each time. It, it will never, never be dependent on the number of roots that we have added so far. So just for an example, if we add an, yet another root epsilon one, we can return to a, a field K2 of type B field. And if the algebraic closure of K needs to, we need to add N plus one roots to, to it to become algebraic closure, we would have still a field of type B, whose elements have type B. Again, this was just the proof sketch of the formalization written in Isabel. The actual, in the actual proof, we don't know how many times we will have to add roots and a finite number of times may not be sufficient. So what, what we do in the proof, inspired by proofs known in the mathematical literature, is to use Zorn's lemma to take, to leap to the, to the limit of a chain of extensions. So I didn't want to scare you with the details, the mathematical details, technical details of the proof. That's why I just kept the high level ideas. But if you want, if you are interested, the, there is, a, a, everything is documented in the paper. As we saw, the main tool in the proof sketch was this idea of changing the underlying type of an algebraic structure using a function from one type to the other. And I want to express this idea because it's simple and can be used in other scenarios. And I, I can show you the details of some of the details in this idea. So there are two ingredients for this to work. First, we need to find, come up with a type B and a function F from type A to B. In the proof sketch, this type B was the, as I said, was the type of multivariate polynomials. And the function f, in that case, was the evaluation of these multivariate polynomials. Now, the, the point that I will show in the next slide is how to construct the field B once we have the field A and a function f, because this is the core of the idea and it's, it, it, I can show it in just one slide. And here I show you the definition of the field B and before I go into detail, I just need to explain you that a field in Isabel is the composition of five terms. A, first, a, there is a carrier set and in the, in the field A here re represented by this carrier underline A. There is also a multiplication function represented by this cross A. There is a sum function represented by the sum underline A and there is of course, the unit for the multiplication, the one, and the unit for addition, the zero. So let's suppose that we have a field A and the function F shown in, in the top of the slide from type A to B. So how do we define the field B? So the carrier of B I have already explained is just the application of the function F to each of the elements of A. Now, where it becomes interesting is the definition of the multiplication of the field B, because we are going to use the fact that we know each of the elements in the carrier of B 
is the application of f to some element in a so what we are going to do is to search for these elements uh, in in the field a make the multiplication there and then return back to b by application of the function f so the multiplication in b mimics the multiplication in 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 a and the same idea we apply the same idea for the definition of the sum and the definition of the unit for the multiplication and the unit for the addition is just the just the straightforward application of f so by using exploiting this fact that we mimic the multiplication in a we get a field b which is isomorphic to the field a so we were able to change the type of the elements in A while keeping all of this algebraic structure. The, all of these the properties satisfied by, by the, the elements in A. And that, this was the key idea for keeping for, for the proof sketch because we were able to keep the roots that we have added so far. Now, before we conclude, I would like to show you yet another example where we could apply this idea of changing the types of algebraic structures. And this example is also to show you that the idea does not only apply to fields, we could use it to rings or other algebraic structures such as groups and monoids. So uh, we are interested now in the definition of the direct product of a ring n times. And we suppose two things. We suppose that we have the ring A of type A ring and uh, the definition for the binary product of, of rings. So here represented by the cross sign. And the transition, now the transition of types is when we, when we take the binary product, uh, it, we, we see the transition from A to A star A. So if you if follow the, the simple idea of iterating this binary product to build the dire direct product of A n times, we would have the dependent type, a dependent type again, because we would have A star A n times. And now just as in the proof sketch, we are going to, to play with this structure, this structure of the, the proof of the definition using the type changing mechanism. And the, the first step is to take the binary product of a ring with the singleton ring with only one element, the, the, the empty list. And the function we are going to, to use to change the types of structures is this function that simply adds an element to the head of the list. So if we apply this function to the to a cross the singleton field, we singleton ring, sorry, we, we have a, a ring B1 of type B, of type lists, of, of type A list. And it's what is interesting is that B1 is isomorphic to the field, to the ring A. Now we can take the binary pro product of b1 and a, apply the function f once again and recover a ring b2 which is isomorphic to a cross a. Now we get, got the idea, we iterate this process and we end up with bn which is isomorphic to a, a times a n times, the direct product of a n times. Therefore, we were not able to build the, uh, uh, the exact direct product of A, but we built something which is isomorphic to this ring. And for most of the cases, this is good enough, uh, especially in proofs of existence, where we don't need to work with the, the, the term that we came up with after the proof. We just need to, to prove that there, ex there is, exists such an algebraic structure. Now we came to the conclusion of the talk and before I go into the contributions, I would like to make a quick remark on related work, which was, is the proof 
in by Contier that every countable field has an algebraic closure. So it's a statement very similar to ours that every field has an algebraic closure, but has this restriction to countable fields. Now this restriction is interesting because it avoids the application of Zorn's lemma, and uh, the proof can be entirely constructive. But the statement is weaker and it precludes the application of the theorem to fields such as the p adic numbers. Now the contributions are the main contributions are two. The first one is the, the formalization of the result itself, and the second one was this simple idea for changing the type of the underlying structures. And some statistics of the development are that we have added a lot of material to the library of algebra in Isabel. And to name just a few, uh, we have added a theory for multivariate polynomials that was important in the proof in the formalization of the result because that's the instantiation of the type B that we have discussed. Another important theory was the finite extensions to work with these to work with algebraic numbers and the extension of a field extending a field with roots and another another theory was the uh, the generic arithmetics of rings which we would then apply to the arithmetics of polynomials and of course there are many more and all of the all of these theories sum up to 15,000 lines of code and the the job was done in five up to five months that's it thank you very much for your attention i hope you have enjoyed the talk and i will be glad to take in further questions okay now as it happens we have eight minutes until the next talk and this particular talk made an interesting contrast with the previous one which remember the previous one was not using carrier sets. And here we have carrier sets and this kind of clever use of isomorphisms. So maybe we can have a kind of more general discussion about these two techniques. Uh, I see Rene Thiemann has his hand up. Yes. Uh, so I didn't yet want to connect uh, the two talks, but uh, thanks, of, uh, first of all, for this interesting talk. I wondered, in this proof uh, that you showed us, uh, I wondered, is it somehow related or can it be used to show that concrete fields are algebraically closed? Like, for instance, that the complex numbers itself are already algebraically closed or the algebraic real numbers, the, uh, the algebraic complex numbers that they are algebraically closed. Is that unrelated proof or uh, is it somehow included in your result? Uh, Paolo, are you there? I hope this question isn't addressed to me. <laughs> No, it was addressed uh, to the speaker. Oh, uh, Paolo. Let's see if Paolo can. Can everyone oh, hear I, me? I... Paolo, yes, can you talk? Oh, okay. So uh, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Actually, it is an unrelated proof. We can't prove, for example, that the complex numbers are algebraically closed using just our proof. We can show that there is an algebraic closure of the real numbers using our result, because every field has an algebraic close, closure. But to show that the two are isomorphic, it would be another proof. OK, OK, thank you. There's another hand up, uh, Andreas. Right, Andreas, thanks. Andreas. Nice talk, definitely. Um, so you mentioned this, oh, you, you have to do a possibly infinite iteration of this jumping back and forth. Uh, I was wondering how much more infrastructure work you need to do to actually also get, get a nice lifting there. Like, how do you ensure that 
your type B actually has these upper limits and how do you make sure that everything is, is preserved across limits? So, so yeah, in, in the proof, uh, in order to make a step, we need to ensure that the function is injective over the carrier of the field we have so far. So for example, in the, if we take the proof sketch, at, after n roots, we would have to make sure that the function f is still injective over the carrier of this field that just gets bigger. So there are some tricks during the proof to, to prove that the function is, uh, it preserves its injectivity, but uh, it gets a little bit technical. I would not be able to explain just by talking. But that's right. the idea to, to prove that uh, we use the structure of multivariate polynomials to prove that this function always is always injective over this specific carrier of fields that gets extended by adding roots. Right. So, so I was mainly interested in the case where you go to the infinity using Zorin's mm -hmm. lemma. Okay. So uh, you can think of uh, the application of Zorin's lemma as as applying this idea a number of times and uh, the proof that it contradicts the maximality of the limit we take from Zorn's Lima would be the one, one iteration of this step. So we take the limit and we prove that by contradiction that if it's not the algebraic closure of the field, it would have to, you would, you would, would be able to still extend it with another route and the function would still be injected, injective. So yeah, it's not exactly the same thing, but we could think of the application of Zorn's Lima as an iteration of this process. Okay, we have another question from Dominic Kirst. Let me just, there you go. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is related. So do you know if assuming Zorn's lemma is really necessary. So could you, for instance, assuming your result that every field can be closed, prove Zorn's lemma from this assumption? That's a, that's a very, very good question. Uh, as I remember, I'm not 100% sure. As I remember, it's an un unsolvable pro problem. It's an open problem. Sorry, an open problem by now. And we don't know yet the if it, they they are they are related, but yeah, there's definitely interested in knowing the answer to this question, because for example, the proof by Gontier does not use the the Zorn's lemma, Zorn's lemma but it's restricted to countable fields. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, there's time for another question. See, is there another hand up? Excuse me, I am hopeless at this. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, let's move on to the next talk.